Hi all, let's uh, start the part five of the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner real exam questions. I'll go through each and every option, give a detailed explanation of each and every option, and then we will arrive at what is the correct answer. So let's start with the questions. So the question goes this way, which of the following AWS features enables a user to launch a pre-configured Amazon Elastic Compute EC2 instance? So what does this say is these are the services which are available and which of these allows you to launch a pre-configured EC2 instance. So pre-configured EC2 instance is a machine image, AMI. There is an option of AMI in AWS. What you can do is you can choose which type of softwares you need. And there are some standard AMIs which are available in the marketplace and there are EMIs which are available where you can see softwares like Tableau, uh, some of the machine learning softwares, which are third party softwares, which is already loaded in an AMI and you have to pay as you go. So let's look at the other options as well. Amazon Elastic Block Store, it is just a storage for EC2 instance. So this answer is incorrect. EC2 Systems Manager is something to manage the ASG and etc. It is not a pre-configured EC2 instance. Let's look at App Stream. So if you see this, this App Stream is a fully managed non-persistent application and desktop streaming service. Okay, so this has nothing to do with pre-configuration of EC2 instance. So the correct answer is AMI. So let's look at the user guide of AMI. It says like, what does the AMI include? It includes uh, EBS snapshots. It has permissions to uh, con uh, permissions that control which AWS accounts can use the AMI to launch instances and a block device mapping. So this everything is clubbed. It is a pre-configured EC2 instance. Let's look at the second question. How would an AWS customer easily apply common access controls to a large set of users? So I've already marked the answer here. This has to be via IAM policy to a group. You see, when you apply, let's look at other options. Okay, so when it says apply IAM policy to a IAM role, so role will be just very few you know users who are assigned that role so but you cannot do a common access control for a large set of users let's see option c apply the same iam policy to all iam users with access to the same workload this will also be not as lucrative because what you are trying to do is create a policy for an entire set of iam users usually we should create users, assign users to a group and create a policy for that group. That is the way to provide access control to a large set of users. And last option, Cognito is something which is very different. Uh, why, why it is used is if you have, just like you see, or if you have a Facebook credential or a Google credential, you can use it for some other applications also like Quora, etc that works through Cognito. So Cognito is a very different thing. It is not linked to this question. This is the correct answer. Well, let's look at this question. What technology enables compute capacity to adjust as loads change? When the load is changing, how do, what will adjust? Load balancing? Yeah, load balancing happens. But you know the way load balancing works is the load balancers are behind, uh, or we can say uh, there are EC2 instances, and in front of EC2 instances, load balancers are there, and they decide to which EC2 instance the load should be mapped to. But uh, let's look at other options. Automatic failover. It's a different thing. Automatic failover is if your EC2 instance fails, the uh, failover will be the load load balancer will 
check the health of the ec2 instance and it is failed so it will pass the load to another ec2 instance that is automatic failover round robin is a different thing where you know your in the esg group also you can keep doing a round robin of the uh, uh, ec2 instances but it's a different thing auto scaling is something which looks to be a potential answer here because in auto scaling what happens is if the load increases your number of ec2 instances uh, scale uh, scales so that it can cater to that load for example in the month of december when the christmas is there the sales are at peak so the load increases the number of transactions increases and hence ec2 instances the auto scaling group will span out uh, scale out the number of ec2 instances and post 15 january or 10 january when the load the number of transactions goes down the auto scaling group will scale in and that is how the compute capacity is adjusted ec2 is compute for compute only so uh, in this respect answer should be d Let's look at another one, which AWS services are defined as global instead of regional. Choose two options. So, for example, EC2 instance, it is pretty much regional, though, you know, globally, you, you can try to access the EC2 instance, you can host applications. But what is global is like something like a Route 53. It can route, uh, it can create routing uh, tables and uh, patterns across the globe. Similarly, cloud front, it can be used across the globe. These are two global services. Uh, now this this question is confusing a bit but uh, because ideally people can say if i put s3 in a region i can still from other region also i can store here we can do it but what what the global means in this nature is for example i think route 53 we can also use with on premises uh, also so that is the nature of globalness we are talking about so the correct answers in this case is these two options they are correct route 53 and cloud front so if you see here route 53 yeah <clears throat> the globally distributed nature of dns servers helps ensure a consistent ability to route your end users to your application by circumventing any internet or network related issues so this is totally global in nature another option you can see for cloudfront is a fast content delivery service and it delivers it to the customers globally with low latency etc so these two are global services Let's look at next one. Which AWS service would you use to obtain compliance reports and certificates? This is by default, I would say, uh, this is a no-brainer. We should always remember all compliance reports and certificates are put in artifact. Rest, it, it doesn't matter. If you see artifact, just click artifact and move it. Lambda is a serverless uh, uh, facility. You can create functions, some minor compute. Inspection is just for, you know, similar to CloudWatch, to, for, to watch uh, metrics, etc. And certificate manager is to manage the TLS or SSL uh, uh, encryption in motion certificates. So the correct answer is AWS Artifact. So if you see here, Artifact, it is your central resource for compliance related information. So this should be a very easy one. Let's look at this one. Under the shared responsibility model, which of the following tasks are the responsibility of AWS customers? So in the shared responsibility model, customers have some responsibility aws has some responsibility here the question is pick two responsibilities for which purely customer is responsible for let's look at the options a says ensuring that the application data is encrypted at rest yes this is something which a customer will do aws will not do the encryption at rest for you you have to enable that service okay it will not happen by default ensuring that aws ntb servers are set to the correct time this is something purely aws will do you will not have access to even change the, the timing and etc so the b is wrong a looks could be correct C says, says ensuring that users have received security training in the use of AWS services. Yes, this is something which you as a customer will have to take care of. D, ensuring that access to data centers is restricted. This is purely AWS functionality because they own the data centers, the physical premises and who gets into the physical premises, it is their responsibility, not your responsibility as a customer. So D is wrong. E says ensuring that the hardware is disposed of properly this is purely aws responsibility you don't have access to the hardware you are not seeing the underlying hardware so how will you dispose of so e is wrong so the correct options are these two let's look at this one which aws service can be used to manually launch instances based on resource requirements so uh, basically you have to launch instances instances where where do we when we hear the word instances automatically we should think of ec2 the correct answer should be ec2 because for option A, EBS is the elastic block store. You do not launch instances. This is a storage which your EC2 instance uses. So A is wrong. 
B says Amazon S3, it's the object store. It is not used to launch instances. B is wrong. D says ECS, this is something related to uh, uh, container service. This is not related to launching instances. So D is also wrong. The correct option is option C. These are no-brainers. If you get these questions in the exam, you can just quickly click and move ahead. Let's look at this option. A company, sorry, uh, this question, a company is migrating an application that is running non-interruptible workloads for a three-year time frame. So a company is already having an application running in, in its on-premises, uh, non-interrupted 24 by 7 for last three years. Now, what it is saying is you are moving that to AWS under EC2. I mean, on EC2, you will deploy this application. Now, which pricing construct would provide the most cost-effective solution? So that question is the cheapest solution. Not the very efficient solution, but the cheapest solution. Let's look at the options. Option A states spot instances. See, we remember spot instances provides 90% of the cost saving. Very cost effective. But will this serve the requirement? No. Because it is saying non-interruptible workloads. Spot instances will interrupt your workloads as soon as you lose the bid and someone else snatches your instance. So this option is wrong. EC2 dedicated instances. Is this option correct? Yes, uh, non-interruptible workload is it is very good for non-interruptible workload because the entire instance is dedicated to you. But is this cheap? No, this is the most expensive. So this answer is also wrong. Option C, Amazon EC2 on-demand instances. On-demand instances, is it cost effective? It may be. It is cost effective compared to dedicated. And uh, does it provide non-interruptible work, uh, workload? Yes, it provides. But let's look at the last option also. Amazon EC2 reserve instances. Is it cost effective compared to on demand? Yes, it is cost effective. Does it provide non-interrupted workloads? Yes, it will provide non-interrupted workload. So, and hence, C will not be our answer. D will be the right answer. This is the correct answer. Now, let's see here. Uh, EC2 instance reserve instances. This is this is providing a significant discount up to 72% compared to on-demand pricing. So it is cheaper than on-demand pricing. And let's look at other things. It saves money, maintains flexibility. It's 72% cheaper than on-demand. Okay. And how does it work? Is uh, it provides a discounted hourly rate and an option capacity reservation for EC2 instances. This is how it works. Let's look at the next one. The financial benefits of using AWS are. Uh, reduced total cost of ownership increased uh, so reduced total cost of ownership yes this is a benefit of aws cloud or any cloud even azure gcp etc so a looks to be right b says increased capital expenditure capex no the capital expenditure reduces drastically because you are not putting anything upfront no investment upfront it is pay as you go so your capital expenses are decreased not increased b is wrong C says reduced operational expenditure OPEX. Yes, your operation expenditure will reduce with the pay as you go or if you use reserved instances, it will decrease drastically. So C looks to be right. D says deferred payment plans for startups. Uh, no, this is not something which is a feature of uh, a key benefit of AWS. Uh, e says business credit lines for startups. No, this is also wrong. This is also not available. So the correct answers are A and C. Let's look at the next one, which AWS cost management tool allows you to view the most granular data about your AWS bill. So it's, this is a billing related question. You have a bill. Now you want to understand which service will give you a very granular data, a very detail level data. Okay, granular means detail level. So the first option says cost explorer, no. Budgets, budgets is to, you know, you can restrict. If you are, you can set a alert. If your budget, if your uh, usage increases beyond say twenty dollars or hundred dollars, uh, this this you can fix the budget. And the moment it crosses the threshold, it will give you an alert. So B is wrong. C cost and usage report. Yes, this is right because it, this is the most detailed report. Billing dashboard is there, but it is not the most detailed report. It's asking about the most granular data. Most granular data you can find in AWS cost and usage report. Now suddenly I see some of the users, they will put a comment that uh, your concept is wrong, etc. So uh, what I do is I try to back up my questions, which most of the documentation that is there in AWS website. So this is what you can see cost and usage reports. They contain most comprehensive set of cost and detail usage data available. So based on this logic, I think this answer should be the right answer. Let's look at this question. Which of the following can an AWS customer use to launch new RDS service? So do you have to build a RDS cluster? Which service? Can you do use to launch it? AWS Consage, no. Consage is a support consultant. Uh, they, they call the support consultant as Consage. So you will not have to contact the Consage to launch this service. This is wrong. 
B says cloud formation. Yes, you can use cloud formation. How the cloud formation work is it is infrastructure as a code. So you can uh, create some uh, code to launch this service. Uh, RDS service, you can create some code to launch the EC2 instance also and blah, 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 whatever bootstrapping you can do, you can do it. But cloud formation can be used for this because this is used for automatic deployment. You just deploy your code uh, in production or in other environments automatically. You don't have to do and the installation manually. C says uh, storage as a service S3. S3 is never used to launch uh, uh, RDS. D says EC2 auto scaling. Auto scaling is just about, you know, uh, uh, scale, scaling out and scaling in. Whenever the load increases, you scale out and scale in. This is not used to launch RDS. This is wrong. E says AWS management console. Yes, you can go to the management console, search for RDS, and you can launch an RDS cluster. That is right. So the correct options are B and E. Now here, this question says, which of the following is a AWS cloud architecture design principle? So with design principle means it's a design principle or a best practice. So option A says implement single point of failure. Never, never do that. Your uh, point of failure should be multiple so that if one point of failure happens, your application doesn't should not go down. So A is wrong. B says implement loose coupling. Yes, you should have loose coupling so that if one fails, the other is still on. So loose coupling should, should be right. Monolithic design means you, you just have one big component, one monolithic component to design the application, which is totally wrong. Implement vertical scaling. See, horizontal scaling like uh, Hadoop cluster, etc. They all are hit and they are all are able to perform better because they do horizontal scaling. Vertical scaling is like, you know, you have the same uh, server and you are trying to upgrade the server so that you can increase the memory capacity and uh, disk space, etc. But that is not something which in the cloud architecture perspective, that is not the best practice or the best design principle. So D is wrong. So the correct answer here is implement loose coupling. Okay, that is the right answer. Now let's look at one more question. Which of the following security measures protect access to AWS account? Okay, we have to do uh, choose two. First is uh, enable AWS CloudTrail. So CloudTrail would would you can enable this service, but this is not something which which is a definite security measure. You can log it. It's it's your choice, but it's not a must uh, security measure. B says grant least privileges privilege access to IAM users. Yes, any this this is a, a security practice. If you if you are from a security background, you already know that that you always grant least privileges to the IAM users. Means whatever they need, you just grant that. Don't grant or uh, give them some extra privileges. So this is the best practice. B is correct. C states create one IAM user and share with many developers and users. It's a strict no no. It's a strict no-no, not only in cloud, in any other environment, it's a strict no-no. You never share your username and passwords for application access. Okay, that is wrong. C is wrong. D says, enable cloud cloud front. See, cloud front is for you know distribution or caching, etc. Uh, but this is not something which, which is a security measure. So D is wrong. E says, use multi-factor authentication for privilege users. Yes, multi-factor authentication, you must have seen even if you have iPhones, there is a multi-factor authentication where it uh, it has two step process to secure your phones. So the second step is some sort of code or password that comes uh, to your mobile and you, you secure it. So that this is right. So these are two correct options. So let's look at this option, which service provides a hybrid storage service that enables on-premises applications to seamlessly use cloud storage. So here we are asking, the question is asking, about a storage service which works in a hybrid mode. See, Glacier, if you see the first option, Glacier, it is only in AWS. It will not work in hybrid. Snowball, it's like, it, it will work in hybrid, it, but it will not be a seamless cloud storage. Seamless means it will be there intact for any time you want to move your data from on-premises to cloud storage, okay? So Snowball is like, if you want to migrate your data, it's just a, something like a suitcase. It You just put the data in and migrate it uh, to cloud. C says storage gateway. Yes, this is the seamless hybrid solution for storage, seamless. Okay, and D is saying elastic block storage. Elastic block storage is only for EC2 instance, only for EC2 instance, and it works only on cloud. It will not work in a hybrid model. It will not work on premises. So storage gateway is the answer here. So this brings us to the end of uh, part five of uh, this series. I've covered few questions here.
if you uh, find this really helpful please put in your comments please like my videos and please subscribe to my channel subscribing to my channel will motivate me to put in more videos because a lot of effort goes in to ensure that i am putting the right information in front of you so i request you to please subscribe to my channel and please like my videos thank you